lesser male. I'm not a beta male either. I'm just a better man. Better man. Yo, GYBB, get your balls back. WWDD, what would Dante do? The sexual revolution is being podcasted, and I am excited. Here's why I'm excited. Uh, mm. First of all, let me say what's up to my boy, Harry. Just get it, because we need to be on this shit together. And, and this is why. This is why. I mean, unless you want to tell well, him why. Well, you know, Dante, I'm living the life. I couldn't be any happier. This is episode 600. We've done this Ep- 600 times, man. Yeah, man. 600 yeah. times. Never missed a week. That is insane yeah. to me. Nobody's that done that. Nope. Nobody has done that. So I'm I'm proud about that. But this is episode 600 and maybe another 600 to go. Let's do that. Let's well, do 1200. It's up to you guys, if you share, if you sign up for the Patreon, you sign up for consultations, we'll keep we we'll keep doing this as long as you keep coming, you keep asking uh, for advice, for help in your relationships and your date. We'll keep doing this till I close my eyes and the great big va- and go to the great big vagina in the sky. You know I what I mean? I think your last words will be on a hospital bed as you pull a a young intern in and go uh, <laughs> leave her, <laughs> and then you close your eyes. <laughs> she doesn't respect you. Uh, uh, Get your balls back. <laughs> what would Dante? Do. <laughs> it's weird uh, what, what the family show though what did, what, what did he say what did he say he, he says uh i need to know my self-worth and that uh <laughs> leave her <laughs> if your you want people that would be great if you were your ghost, mama's you? a hoe <laughs> who is she to tell you that you ain't shit she's never chosen a, a good man in her life how could she possibly know about Relay. <laughs> come, come you, um, you can't wife a hoe. You can't wife a hoe. Can't make a hoe a house. <laughs> what did he mean? What did he mean? What was he what trying he... to say? <laughs> but this uh, is what, what this has been our lives for uh, over ten years now. Six hundred episodes and. uh I, I guess we thought we'd go over for we got some we always have new listeners and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. so we thought we'd go a little bit of the history of so, Man School 202. I, I really, right. So there's new people. So those who don't know this. Uh, so the uh, the great Patrice O'Neill was was uh, one of my best friends uh, from probably 2000, probably from 2002 on until probably you know until he passed away i mean we had a little tit tat tiffy tiffy tat yeah, but, but to be friends with patrice meant that you would be at some point fighting yeah, means, patrice there was nobody the, who didn't have a fight with yeah, patrice yeah, because yeah, it was yeah. that's how patrice handled stuff yeah um and so what happened was uh i I was uh we were friends with him and I was friends well, with him. Well, how do you meet Patrice, by the way? How, how so did that come we're about? A, we're at a start, we're at a uh, so this is a great story. Um I had heard about Patrice before I even started I, like like when I first started doing comedy and I I was I was doing open mics and uh we I uh was always progressive about getting better and stuff and and so I had a group of guys we used to sit down every week and do a writing workshop right it was real kind of goofy but uh, you know that's the type of you don't know any better that's the type of things you start to do when you're a comedian you know like all right all right well let me get together with other comedians and yeah yeah and as you grow you don't need all that that shit and and you also realize that your journey is your journey and uh but but it i honestly it helped because it it got you thinking in a in comedic ways being around comics so i guess it was good and uh there was a young lady by uh by the name of Jessica Delfino, very funny girl, still funny girl. She does a lot of musical, um she does like a like a lot of musical comedy. And at the time she was dating uh uh Kurt, Kurt Metzger, Metzger, I think. Yeah, yes, Kurt, Kurt Metzger. Metzger. And we used to do she you know, Kurt was doing it a little longer than me, and uh it was kind of a thing where we would do this thing, and she said to me, she liked my comedy. She says, you know, you, you have a sensibility like Patrice O'Neill. You should meet him. And me being the cocky dick I was, uh, I was like, uh, I was like, uh, well, um, he needs to meet me. That's what I, I kind of felt. So um, now, mind you, I had already spent, um, you know, I had 
lives before I started doing comedy. So I was uh we started comedy, comedy quite late in in, in the yeah, comedy in the game. years. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was 34 when I started. Yeah. So I had a uh, I had um you know, I went to college. I worked as a I worked in um in child care and not in child care, New, New York State Division for Youth. Actually, when Mike Tyson was in there, he was a is it was a juvenile in Chattake up in uh, up in the Catskills. And I lied about my age because I was too young to do this kind of youth work. I went to SUNY New Pulse and I was upstate and then I was working with with um emotionally disturbed kids. Uh hence uh, Mike Tyson was up there and I lied about my age and I kind of falsified some documents and I was because you're not supposed to work in that field into 2000 in, until you're 21, at least till you're 21. Um, but some of those kids were my age, you know, um, especially say, since I had lied about my age. Um, and uh, I was uh, I was at SUNY New Pulse and I pledged I pledged Omega and then I got into this situation where there was a there was a Toys for Tots thing, and I, uh, and each uh, of the Divine Nine. If anybody doesn't know what the Divine Nine is, the um, uh, it's the fraternity? major black black Greek letter fraternity. You know, it would be Kappa Sigma Omega, which was mine. Uh, Q uh, Q dogs, Deltas, whatever. I'm not going to go over Deltas, AKA Sigma Gamma Rho, whatever. And they had a they, the male the fraternities were represented in a Toys for Tot benefit, and they wanted to do a male review with with each crew represented. I was not the first choice, but they, what happened was they they had all these guys that were going to do it, and everybody backed out, and I ended up being one of the guys that stuck with it. It was only me, and I I did um I was actually uh knew the guy who came up. To, to strip because they had to hire professional strippers. And that's how I got into the business. I knew the guy, he lived in my neighborhood and we, you know, I started doing it. So I did 10 years of, of male stripping and I had a group and I traveled up and down the East coast and some, some abroad and whatever. And I was in the martial arts. I was just a maniac. And I ended up being a personal manager at the cheetah club. Uh, if anybody knows Brooklyn it was, uh, I was, uh, Farragut and uh, Flatbush was like really kind of gritty, grimy, sucking dick uh, kind of kind of club at the time. Well, and, you're not uh, sucking dick. The, no, I was the, I was dancers. actually ma I was actually managing them because of the fact that this is an interesting, a fun fact because we we all hear about uh, crazy ass Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani was mayor, and he well, and I, I don't know if he was mayor, but I, I think he was mayor, what and he was been? he was trying to clean up. This is when they were cleaning up New York, cleaning up 42nd Street. When you look at the old videos of of all the, the broken down uh, peep shows and prostitution and stuff and the holes on, on 42nd Street and uh, and time and off of Times Square and Ninth Avenue and shit like that. So fast forward, uh, the, the girls were uh, turning tricks in the club and the I was hired to stop. This is an interesting. I was hired to stop them from turning tricks in the club because Rudy Giuliani had the vice squad out and he was closing clubs up for turning tricks. What's wrong with him? Mm. This is clearly he a commodity. A real duddy. <laughs> Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> a real wet blanket, that fucking this guy. This guy is, a, as my father would say, a wet dish rag. <laughs> mm. But I like the idea. That must have been conflict for you. Wait a minute. I'm supposed to stop I'm supposed people to from stop having these sex. From selling pussy? That's all I. That's all I've been programmed to do <laughs> since the time I was a kid. <laughs> and they and I and I went. I was like, stop fucking in the club. Stop fucking in the club. Basically, they would give a guy a lap dance, pull it, pull it, pull a little bikini to the side, and uh, and turn tricks in the club, right? And just, and, the, and they the, what happened was the, the the club owner didn't want to get closed down because Rudy Giuliani was sending spies out. What a piece of shit he was, which is interesting because when you watch him in, in the Borat movie, when he lays back to get his dick sucked is is I don't know if anybody was the greatest thing ever when he, he uh, he's in the Borat movie and he thinks this girl is going to blow him and his old troll ass lays back to get his dick sucked. So, um. But these girls would not stop turning tricks in the club. And so I was like, hey, you guys want to sell pussy? 
why don't we do it outside of the club? Hence how I became a personal manager. And that's like a community leader. That's the equivalent of when they do those midnight basketball games. Like, listen, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we want to, we want to find somewhere you guys can uh, hang out, uh, you know, so you don't get into trouble. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to take you, take you guys. On, and that's how I got into it. So I, uh, at the time I was always a, a fan of comedy and I wanted to, do comedy but i was so in deep entrenched into this you know the sex industry to some extent that uh i didn't think anybody would take me seriously um and i finally started doing comedy in 2000 i, I met patrice in 2002 and as I, I but this young lady um uh jessica delfino said to me uh you should meet this guy patrice she goes but he's really mean and he has this dark oily substance and i quote he has a dark oily substance not unlike not unlike sludge pump that pumps through his heart right this was her impression of him and i was like oh. that's a hell of an introduction that's got to be great so you <laughs> think i'm like him i should I, yeah meet she this just, no no but he's just he's she like the you, comedic but styling he, yeah. he's not like you but he's like whatever so I remember going to the to the Boston Comedy Club and this is big dude like six six. He's like four hundred pounds. And he was actually um there was a little little white girl, probably about 90 pounds. Her name was Laura Lipschitz. She was a comic back in the days. And he's got her in the back and he's just like leaning over, got his big ass arm on her, leaning and he's sitting in the back talking shit and whatever. And then I just I didn't even know it was him, but I just I he kind of had a very kind of, you know, um, you know, a confident vibe to him. And somehow we talked and 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 we exchanged numbers somehow, which is weird, which is really weird for Patrice to exchange numbers for anybody. And um we I called him because I used to call any comics that were actually working comics, I used to pick their brain all the time. I was very eager to learn the business. And I called him up and we talked about comedy and a few different things. And I go, you know, um, when I first got into comedy, somebody said, I, I need to learn, I need to meet you. But they said that your, your heart pump, pumps out a black oily substance. And he laughed that, that big, laugh, <laughs> right. And then he hung up the phone. Um, the phone rings like three minutes later, he calls me back and he says, yo, let me ask you something. I go, sure. He goes, um, if somebody told you that I was such a horrible person, what made you call me? And I said, well, first of all, I don't pay attention to what other people say. And second of all, I'm not scared of you. Right. And he laughed again. Right. And I think that was kind of the start of the, of the, the friendship was that, you know, I, I wasn't afraid of him. I mean, by that time I had been stabbed twice and I shot at and just all kinds of crazy. My life was in a really crazy. So, Dealing with some comic that, you know, might have a sharp tongue just wasn't my, you know, that wasn't something that I per se that you were afraid of. I yeah. wasn't afraid of. I mean, yeah. it ain't going to kill you. Right. And and we became friends from there. Um, so I think what happened was um, we became friends. We used to hang out a lot and uh, not a lot, but we would hang out until we got tired of each other. It was always a kind of a situation where we'd hang out and then I'd be like, yeah, enough of you. And we would just go our separate ways. And I mentioned that I was a stripper. He's in, uh, I get a call from him, maybe like one o'clock in the morning and he would never, Patrice would never uh, say hello. He would just start talking. Uh, so if so you far, call him up, you go, hey, Patrice, what's going on, man? No, no, he would call you up. Yeah, yeah. And and not say hello. Like right. the phone would ring, you'd pick it up and he'd be like, Yo, I'm sitting here with this this funky hoe, right? <laughs> that, that's how he would that's how he, he goes, cuts I'm, right I'm, to the point. He I'm was making here. TikTok videos before it was uh even a thing. Yeah, he'd yeah. Get right to the hook. He'd he'd right, right to the, to the point. He got he he he'd be like, Man, I'm sitting here with this funky asshole. And I call to tell you I, I apologize. And I go, okay, what's up? Right. He goes, I'm, 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 I'm laying up in the bed with this fucking asshole, and I mentioned your stripper name, Prince Mandingo, and this bitch has not stopped talking about you since, since I mentioned your name. It's been a half hour going on, and she's still talking about you and what you did at your time and such and such. I go, well, yeah. He goes, you didn't tell me that it was like that, and I was like, well, I mean, what do you? I mean, what does that mean, like that? 
And he said, you should have told me that. I go, well, what, what would I have told you that I was I was one of the top strippers? I, I, like if that was a pastime. Then it that also would have been it would have been bragging and it would have been yeah, annoying. I, like and like he so, gives a shit. It's another yeah, industry. And it was something I had already moved past. I was like I was trying to be a comic, you know, and an actor. And that, you know, that was great. And then you pull upon that. Those are memories. But I'm always trying to make new memories. Um, so I think he gets a call from Opie and Anthony. And they and he's on Opie and Anthony at the at the time at the Opie and Anthony's height. And Patrice That's, is on the yeah, at, at XM. He would do a lot of he would do a WNEW appearances. When yeah, they were yeah, syndicated. And then when they went and to Fox XM, News, he would do Fox News. He would too. do Fox News a lot. Yeah, yeah. And uh, before it was Fox News, <laughs> like it was kind of balanced. And uh, and I remember him. Uh, he used to go in there. So what happened was he went out to Brazil, and the Brazil, he used to say, he used to go out to Brazil and fuck the hookers in Brazil, right? And all of them would go out. All his crew would go out, like Bobby Kelly and Keith and all of them used to go and 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 you know, that was like the thing. What we would what we would call passport bros nowadays, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. That was that was they would that was a thing. That's a thing now. Yeah, yeah. Well, before they used to go to Dominican Republic and Brazil and sometimes go to Medellin to Colombia. So his manager and Jim Norton, the great Jim Norton <laughs> and Keith Robinson, all, all these old school dudes would go out and they would they would they would go out there. And then I remember Patrice saying to me, you know, it's, it's different out there. He was trying to explain to me. It's He's trying to get you there. to come along, right? Yeah, he wanted to come along. But I was living that here in Brooklyn and yeah. Queen. You know what I mean? Because I was an extra, but just I already knew what he was trying to figure out. And what happens is, so let me just say the sex industry, first of all, it's a third world country. Brazil's a third world country. Second of all, the, the women are subservient and they're raised to be subservient and raised to take care of their man. Um, so at a, on a base level, as a man, they kind of put a man like you're supposed to cook your man's food. You're supposed to fix his plate. You're supposed to, in a lot of ways, like a lot of, a lot of Spanish um, households, you know, a lot of, mm. Dominican the role is defined. The, the woman is the uh, roles are very subservient defined. to the man. Yeah. And uh, so going out to Brazil was a situation where he he kind of had experienced this situation because um, there was not the opposition that black women would give you. Um, and so he was like, you know, it's, you remember him saying to me that uh, uh, <laughs> he said that prostitutes in brazil they don't sell your pussy they sell dreams right <laughs> that they that what they do is uh is 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 as it's there's a difference it's almost like the sex is secondary that the that the sex even though it's transsexual it's not transactional like in prostitution in 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 america is like i give you this amount and i give you this and it's it's very transactional Whereas in Brazil and these other third world countries, there is a there's a sexual kind of basis that's always present. And then there's men are being held at a higher esteem and women treat them in a certain way. And and so the sex. Yeah, they, they you know, it's a, you live in a funky ass country where, you know, you know, it's it's uh you know, you, you could you could buy a house for seven dollars. And now, so so the money is transactional when, you know, you'll hear this a lot of times, or you, at least you used to hear this, that, um, you know, uh, well, you pay for the pussy anyway. You would hear that being said, it, well, I got to pay for dinner. I got to do this. I gotta. One way or another, you're paying is the right, idea. Right, you're paying. Yeah, was the you idea. may not be paying cash, but you're paying. In, it may in not be form. exact uh, dollar for dollar transactional, but it is something that, you know, I, and, um when you are a male stripper it's really not transactional because women perceive you as having a higher value and the reason why they perceive you as having a higher value because other women perceive you as having a higher value show sure, it's a lot about muscles and and looking good and smelling good and all of that stuff but there's really that without all of that is a perception it's, it's sort of the way that we perceive money i mean money is just paper it's a note for or it's a note to say that this is this is worth a certain amount of goods and services. And then we so we agree if we agree on it, then it's worth something. And the day that we decide that we agree that it's not something, then that changes. So he went on Opie and Anthony. 
he, he, so would he goes talk he, about that trip and and a right, bunch he of other things. He talked about that yeah. trip and he talked to me about it and he and he's got he so that was kind of the revelation for him to understand that, By the way, that while we're talking about this, let's not forget a key detail if you haven't watched that clip is that he would also start <laughs> Patrice would always have to up the game a little bit and what do you he mean? started carrying a briefcase full of glass dildos oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with yeah. him to Brazil that uh, that he had to <laughs> check through airport security and 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 he would have he would have lingerie like he would buy lingerie from the dollar store here or whatever to the cheap dollar store and he would take cheap lingerie and dildos for his <laughs> so he had a suitcase full of glass dildos that he would go down to Brazil and just try it out on these girls, right? They would just, like a whole, and it got to be big. Like, it was two suitcases. I mean, and some of the stuff was like blown glass, like expensive glass dildos and uh, surgical steel and all. It's just insane. So it was like him going down there, which who was a guy who maybe didn't get a lot of chicks in his life. I mean, he wasn't like the smoothest guy. And to go down there and just to understand that that the the uh, that the sex was not tra directly transactional. And then the confidence that he came back with because of the fact that, you know, we you know, I, and a lot of the concepts that we talk about now is, that a, you know, a woman. How does a woman know your value? It's it's what you tell her. So if you approach her with a way as if as if you have value, then she believes you and she treats you accordingly. And so all of a sudden, because he could go down to Brazil and 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 have threesomes and foursomes with a bunch of chicks at any time he wanted and whatever some of the most beautiful women he'd ever been with in Brazil, he could he, he, he you know if he, he he wasn't taking no shit from a five. From East New York, you know, it was just like, right. nah, was, uh, you know what? I'll just wait till I go back to um, Brazil, yeah, to Brazil. And how uh, did that change his attitude or perspective when he's on Opie and Anthony? Because I remember the thing was he would there would be a lot more relationship talk as the years went on from. Right. Him. So he was he was angry because of the fact that this was a this was a thing that it would that that American women, Americanized women made it so difficult to to like them and what's interesting even about that is that the the i think a lot of time and a lot of times i, I mean i i, I think there's the, the feminist movement put forth this 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 sense of being hard and you have to do this and you have to do that when if you think about like helen of troy and cleopatra women have always had power but that power has always been in their femininity like you're not going to outstrength a man but you can out feminize like I mean, like, you, like Helen of Troy. They, I mean, countries in, in Greece and Athens went to war because of this woman's feminine wares. Um, Cleopatra ran ran a game, ran game on Mark Antony and Caesar. So throughout time, I, I think that women have really instead of um, checking the, the power that they do have. Um, they've tried to be tried to gain masculine power, which um, is good, bad, or otherwise. It's just a, I mean, it's an observation on my point. But I, but I would, I've said this a thousand times, that a man who feels appreciated will give you anything. Because the bottom line is, most of the stuff that we do as men, we do it for access to women. We don't really care about that. I mean, look, I, you, if you might be into fast cars. Or motorcycles, but most of the house. When you get the house with the circular stairs and the circular driveway and the double sinks and and the widescreen TVs, we guys most for the most part are doing that so that they can impress women. It's so that women see you as a viable entity. And given a situation where you ask, "What do you really need as a man?" Most of the time, you wouldn't pick those things. I mean, you might like a fast car, but even the fast, even a even a high end car is so that women, so you could drive women around. I mean, there's a, I, I, what's crazy about it is the fact that we've gotten to this point where we don't understand that intricately part of humanity is is mating and, and, and courting each other. And so it, it is, you know, I don't believe in, in, in the afterlife and I don't believe in a, in a, in a deity, but, but one of the things that immortality is moving your DNA from one generation to the next. That's how, in my opinion, that's what the immortality is. 
So not having access to that is 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 the death of your genetic material, the death of your line. And so I, I think that I think as much as I think that human beings have grown beyond that in a in a much more sophisticated way, um, we're not taking we no longer taking into consideration basic fundamental things that we um that that are just so that's 250,000 years of humanity understanding mating and and roles and 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 what we have to do for the species to, to survive and none of that has to do with lgbt or anything we're talking about just mating hooking up together um and and I'm not discounting any any of those other things, but I'm saying you cannot. The, the, if men and women don't hook up, then the species goes extinct. Then yeah. we we're we're just no more. There is no more of it. We acknowledge so. that you know the you know LGBT trans rights. It's all human rights, but it's not to talk yeah. about those things are a smaller portion of the population. So it doesn't help escalate the dialogue and and of what's going on with most. Relationships, most, most relationships, a majority, I think what is it 90 percent. I'm, I'm trying to remember what, the, you know, different studies have different numbers, but it's a very high number, 80 to 90 percent where it's, it's heterosexual most, is, is heterosexual. So it doesn't help to just discuss every aspect or every nuance. I'm going to look that up, too. I want to I want right, to want to be accurate. Let me see. Yeah, I'll look yeah. it up while you. Uh, so, but, so you were sorry to get back to it. Um, so this is that thing that sort of jolted Patrice into this new mindset and yes, new perspective yeah. about women. And he brought that to the Opie and Anthony show all the time. And, and he it started became... talking about it, talking yeah. about it, talking about it. And, and would then, he talk uh, to you about it? I mean, he would constantly talk to me. We, yeah. we, we would have these long two or three hour conversations about, you know, when he was dating and how women would treat be uh, ungrateful and this and that and the other and how great it was. And he kept trying to get me to go to Brazil. But I was like, man, I I know this already because I was a male stripper. And so I got a chance to be pursued like women pursue pursue everywhere you go is Brazil. Yeah. Make your immediate so, circle Brazil. It's like I, being in a diplomatic immunity. You're the embassy. Exactly. Exactly. So it, I was like, I don't, he was like, yo, you really need to come and see. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't really, not only that, but I was, um, when I met him, I was, I was married and I was raising somebody else's kid at the time. I had a stepdaughter, two year old stepdaughter. And, uh, um, and I remember him the first time he met my, my, my first wife, he was like, man, how you, how you got a, how you got a bad chick like that? And you only been doing comedy uh, six months. I was like, because I had a life before this. It had which, nothing to do with comedy. It, it, had, yeah. it had to do with you being you. And he didn't really understand that until he went to Brazil. Yeah. And also because Patrice being a guy who didn't exactly have game as a young man. Right. All, a lot of the numbers he pulled were because of comedy where, you know, right. it's you. the spotlight is on you. And when you right. get a comedy, women like confidence, women like somebody who can who can who has control. And where do you have more control than being the only person in the room with a microphone in your hand yeah. entertaining an audience of hundreds of people? And he was the original neg guy. Like I've seen him pick up a girl. He was like, yo, we were in the supermarket, right? And it was a fantastic cook. Like he was amazing at at a as a as a cook. And he he's ran into this girl and he goes, uh, you look like your breath stinks. <laughs> and she would go, What the fuck did you say, you fat motherfucker? Blah, blah, blah. And she would yell at him. And then he would go, Listen, I'm sorry. I just, I just, I think you're so beautiful and attractive. I didn't know how to approach you. Well, why didn't you say that? Blah, blah, blah. And he would, he would get this, this rise out of them, this emotional rise, because there's not a, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a thin line between hatred and passion. <laughs> So he would elicit this emotional response and then flip it into him you know, like, look, I'd love to take you out to dinner. And and I've watched it work over and over. One time I remember we were in the supermarket and he picked up this chick because she, she had a bunch of breakfast cereals. He's like, I see you buying all them breakfast cereals for all your damn kids. <laughs> and he was like, I don't even have she like, I don't even have no kids. And he was like, Come on, bitch. You got kids. Look at all them. All that Captain Crunch. I can't even like Captain Crunch. Now, the simple fact that he was she was engaging him in conversation, which was which was was his goal in the first place. I don't even have no kids. And then he would go, listen, I'm 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 man, I'm sorry. I was wrong to calm down. Just but I just really find you attractive. And he would flip it. And I've seen this work a hundred times. 
So okay, he, I have he, I have the numbers, by the way, just for a second from a, a Gallup poll, which is the uh, the leader in polls in at least this country and mm-hmm. the, the ones that the, the the ones the news use. Uh, right. The percentage of U.S. adults who self-identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or something other than heterosexual has increased to a new high of seven point one percent. Wow. Um, in a, in in the new Gallup poll here, this is from so 90, uh, 93 percent of people. Yeah, this right. is from twenty twenty two, so it's fairly okay. recent. Right. Yeah, fair enough. So again, so, nothing wrong with that. It, it's just that the you point know, is that it's not the majority, it's and not the, the way, majority. The reason why in, yeah. the species moves on is because of because men and women hook up together. So, um, which is something I'm going to explore in my own head. It just got my mm. brain to. So but, um, I'll send you that article. I know, I already know that I got to send you that article. So yeah, yeah. Because yeah, now you're going to do the research. Yeah. But now, so the thing way. that we're we're trying to get back to the history of the show. So right? I, let me. So he he was talking about this stuff on. He was angry at how what how women in Brazil treated him as opposed to how American women treated him. And he constantly moved. He was he was one of the, he was a lot. This is where our similarities would happen. We something would kind of like that little poll you gave me. And then it would send me down this rabbit hole thinking about all the ramifications of it and all the things that are important and why this and how this affects humanity and stuff. And so he was on this thing where he would be on opening Anthony would talk about relationships and women and the, 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 the what was going on and what he thought was. And so, um, Opie goes, you're like the you're like Dr. Phil. You're like the he goes, you're like the the black Dr. Phil. And he goes like black Philip as a joke, right? Just to, to demean it. You mean like black Philip, right? And so we uh so at the height of Opie and Anthony, they were given shows like Rich Voss had a show and Billy They Bird had a whole show. channel on Sirius yeah. Satellite Radio. So yeah. they yeah. So uh, these comics could come on and do their own shows and stuff. And uh, and he picked me. He calls me. I'm yo. He, the phone would ring. Everybody, yo, listen, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> I'm like, hey, good morning. You know? Yeah. And he like, oh, you um, I want you to come on the radio with me. We're going to do this this thing on relationship, a relationship show. And I'm like, I bet. And what's the format? He goes, you just what we do on the phone all the time is come on and talk shit. And that's. We ended up doing 13 episodes from 2006 to 2008, and it never got picked up. And never, we never got a show. We never got greenlit for a show. But that, that is that black, the black Philip material was the stuff that went online. And I had the experience because of the fact that I had lived it. And Patrice was coming into this all through, through basically the sex industry and, and his experience through the sex industry. So if I remember, I think there was some type of contract offered to him, but he didn't like the terms of it or something. If I, that, if I, I, w- I wasn't even aware of that. If they that's was... what they said on Opie and Anthony, but, but you know, <laughs> it's been a long time. So that was yeah, my yeah. memory of it. But yeah, you would do that show together. And uh, on the weekends, it was and first we would all, only do it when they asked us to do it. Yeah, like, it was also Patrice was never like, let's do the show. It was like if they asked to do it, when's the next time you're going to do Black Phillip? Uh uh, the show was called Black Philip Bitch Management, right? <laughs> which was which was a little inappropriate, if I might add. Um, and that that got on that became this cult following. And, and a lot of the f- listeners, I mean, even to this day, there's people um, who especially after to, he passed away. Yeah. Everything yeah. that people are starting to gobble. It happens when you pass away. People start gobbling up like and this is pre YouTube. Work. This is pre YouTube as well. Like, I don't even think you two was on or at least it was. It was in its infancy. It was around. Yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it wasn't like a thing like it is now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, I remember running it after he, he had passed away in 2010 or 2011, one or the other. 2011. 2011. And I um, I remember this kid coming to me like there was a kid in the front row and he was like looking at me and i was fucking with him all, and then he waited for me after the club after the show and i thought oh god i have to fuck somebody up and he goes oh i came here to see you and i was like well, yeah what did i do and he was like oh black philip and i was like uh my good friend amazing jazz trumpetist jonathan finlay said remember jonathan Oh yeah, I remember the Jonathan Finley. So yeah, that's he was where this thing touring in Sweden or something. I think he set up. He set up a life. Yeah. I remember he was just decided to be the you know amazing just as an artist in fin- uh, Sweden. Sweden. Then he taught kids trumpet and everything. Amazing kind of experimental trumpet trumpetist and 
but he was the guy. And then uh, I think what happened, I think what happened was, Harry, I think after the fact, you and I did, uh, we were doing I remember Mike Di Stefani. Yeah. You remember Mike Di Stefani? We, Mike Di Stefani, one of the funniest dudes, that another dude that passed away, one of the juggernauts that passed away in comedy. Um, I, I got hired to do his uh, his brother's birthday party. Mike Di Stefani and uh, Di Stefano and um, Harry yeah, was. Yeah, I it. was. I was booked to be the opener for that. We had the same management at the time, right? Right. And right. so I was opening, and so you know, I we had no. You and I had known each. We known each other. We always passing, spoke. just yeah. but from stand up. But we, you know, you were always very friendly, and we started out kind of at the same time at the Boston Comedy Club, so we knew each other a little bit. Uh, but on this gig, you, you know, then you called me up, you found out it was me. You go, you know, hey, do you want to write up? I go, all right, yeah, yeah that'll save me some cash, you know. So yeah. we write up and uh, we write up, we get to this gig. It's like a, a anniversary party of loud yeah. Italians. It's it is uh, has the a worst of a the, shit gig, the worst gig ever that yeah. you could you can't get a gig worse than that. I mean, they were I think you're supposed to do like 30 uh, no i, I was supposed, supposed to do an hour you're supposed to do like 45 to 55 an hour. Yeah, yeah i was supposed to do like you know 20 to open i think i did like eight you did 15 and we got the fuck out of there yeah, that was because about it the was just people yelling and screaming trying moment. to be the funniest person but there was a lot of we got there early they fed us they took care of us there was a lot of downtime yeah in between the first of oh, the first thing i do remember is when uh when we drove up, uh, I remember initially you're like, hey, I mean, I got to make a couple phone calls. I'm like, all right, whatever. So you think you have made three or four back to back phone calls to the different uh, the the different women on your roster at the time, one yeah. after the other. And you looked at me and goes, eh, I'm a dirt bag, aren't I? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not hey, judging. Hey, baby. Hey, yeah. was, hi. Blah, 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 blah. Right. And uh, and you were with you were with your ex wife now at that point. And I think you were going through some shit yeah too, i mean right? we had uh we had broken up but it, it was uh yeah i was going through my own shit i was yeah. going through a i was going through a breakup um mm. and i was i mean i was just, just depressed everything bad yeah. that could have happened in that moment happened i was going through a breakup i lost uh a job i was unemployed and i mm. had i was supposed to do letterman i had been yeah. i had been scheduling a date to do letterman with the the booker who ended up having to resign because of some new york times article he got um, me too he didn't what? get me too because he didn't do anything right, inappropriate right, right, right. actually technically what he, what he did get he got canceled he got right. canceled he said that women are not funny is that what was, he said not directly there was an article that somebody had written because i think it started with amy schumer she had mm -hmm. she was upset that she this was before amy schumer blow blew up Mm -hmm. uh, both figuratively and literally yeah. um, <laughs> before Amy Schumer had gotten big, uh, she wanted to do Letterman as a lot of comedians do. And she right. they didn't they wouldn't book her. Uh -huh. And they did an article. Then it became a whole thing of like, why aren't women being allowed on Letterman show and all this? Why don't they book more women? And then they asked the booker, Eddie Brill. And he Eddie said that he just found that most women didn't have a style of comedy. Mm -hmm. That was I, I don't know what wor what verbiage he used, but just ba basically saying like a lot of the women who get pushed are not the quality of their material is not good. We just want to book. We don't we book quality, not based on sex or whatever. Right. And right. that was sort of a thing of like inappropriate oh, women. Women don't women don't have quality. And da, yeah. da, da, da. And it was so, this whole thing. So he, it was one of those things that he had to fall on the sword and resign. Yeah. And in the wake of that, I lost uh, an opportunity to do Letterman. Right. Um, so you was in a dumb. I was and in then, a shitty. And this shitty is right place. around the time that podcasting, and there was a few people that had podcasts, but not many. I think it might have been, uh, what Keith and the girl was probably the only one that I remember when it was podcasting, and and I am. There was very few. I think I think Corolla was there. Mark Marin, maybe. I don't think just... Corolla was there either. No, Corolla I mean, might not have been, but you're right. Keith Malley was like the first dude. Then uh, Marin's was huge. With Marin started later, but then he became huge, and Corolla wasn't there. And then uh, and you know, and then it started growing. But it, I mean, at that time, podcasting was only audio. No, I mean, nobody was doing a video. The technology podcast. didn't exist to do it cheaply and quickly at yeah. that point. But yeah. yeah, so Dante, you know, Dante talked to me that night about my relationship and, you know, fixing me and, you know, and, uh, you know, I think Dante knew I had a technical background. 
So, yeah, you know, yeah. just one day Dante calls me up after this event. He goes, Hey man, I kind of want to do a podcast. Could you, would you be able to help me out with doing a podcast? Like mm. what would I need to do a podcast? So I gotta get, I gotta, I gotta tell you this. I have been approached to do many podcasts at that point. And right. some people I like, some people I did. How many times did you get approached about podcasts? Cause you had the technical background. The technical background and as a comedian, some of it was just as a comedian, uh, five to 10 different times, if I uh -huh. remember, in various, some for uh -huh. technical reasons, some just like, hey, man, we should do something together. And I would always go, yeah, yeah, sure. No worries. Let's do it. And then nine times out of 10, nobody would get back to you. They just lose interest or something. Right. So Dante, Dante would call me back up. He goes, all right, I want, I'm serious about this podcast thing. All right. When can we do it? I go, all right, all right. Oh, I guess he's serious. Shit. But right, the first <laughs> thing we need, you, you got to get this, this, and this. You got to get a soundboard. You got to get this or whatever. I go, all right. And I hang up the phone. I go, we'll see, whatever. Figure in. And then like a day later, all right, I got the soundboard. When can we? I'm like, oh, shit. Now I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> like, fuck. He's the only one who ever said, whoever followed through with his fucking commitment. <laughs> shit. All right. And then, um, you know, so then we started doing the podcast. The first What's interesting, too, is office. we had, we were doing the, we were doing the, um, the podcast at, on my dining room table and we well, were, the first was, ones were in, yeah. in, in jeff glass's office in some right, right, in right, new right, york right, right. we borrowed somebody's office and it had a massive echo in it or whatever yeah, and then yeah, yeah it was crazy then then we did after like a handful of those we did them um, we went to your your house we'd do it at the dining room table and, and we would have uh, <sighs> I want to say 10 mics sometimes. Like, we loved having, I think we had like seven or eight, seven yeah. or eight mics. And you liked some, some of the jam of the party. I hated that. I think yeah. I, I vocalized <laughs> that. I, I was like, this is just, because we'd experiment with different formats. Sometimes it was just us. Sometimes we'd have a guest that we talked to. And then every once in a crazy. while. It was you know, like, it actually was Fresh and Fit before Fresh and Fit. Yeah, just but we had. Yeah, we had the fucking common sense to stop because it's a goddamn train wreck. Like yeah, sometimes yeah. they were fun, like some of them were wild and chaotic fun, but we weren't helping anybody. <laughs> like, yeah, we yeah, 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 having yeah. a good time, but we were like, all right. And I, I was like, we need to get more focus. And but you also sometimes we'd book, we'd do two, book two back to back, and everybody yeah, would yeah. show up at one. But Fresh and Fit does that shit because they don't have the faith that they can do a real show, yeah. which is why yes. they invite ten women. Yeah. So that hoping that one or two might be interesting, which yeah. has never been yeah. my fan. But anyway, so, you know, we did it out of your house, out of the dining room table. And then until you built a studio. Yeah, I, I was like, I started. So I was I was actually doing voiceover auditions and I ran into the guy who builds the builds the sound studios. He's like the the guy for uh sound studios in every major um agency that does voiceover and stuff like that and uh I, I was asking the guy question the guy who was auditioning me uh i was supposed to be doing trying to do a snickers commercial voiceover and i was like wait i was asking him questions about soundproofing and stuff like that. he goes well you know not for nothing but the guy who builds we're building a new studio um you know we we he's here now could you you know you could probably talk to him and i was like really and he was like yeah yeah sure sure and he i so i did my audition i went in and i talked to this guy and this is another thing i i, I say to young dudes all the time it's like if you are genuinely curious about somebody's life life's work they will give you the cheat code I mean, this dude talked to me for two hours about ambient sound and external sound and soundproofing and gave me notes and shit. And then I started building a studio. We had probably we had probably had the best professional studio in New York City. The best at the home early, studio, yeah. Home studio, a bar, anybody. Out of anybody, yeah. We changed it multiple <laughs> times. Dante, yeah. every once I'd show up and every time Dante would have some new thing where you're like, yeah, man, I got a, I got a, I got a mini fridge so that we could stock the full bar for the guests. <laughs> you're like, all right, that's great, awesome. And then and we had, I a got table, a wine I rack, had, and, I had yeah. a table. Uh, you know, just where it was kind of like my project, and 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 people would come in and they would come into the house, and they it was like it was difficult because everything was so. I mean, Brooklyn wasn't as live as it is now, and so if you did something in Brooklyn, it was like oh, I don't want to come to Brooklyn, and then they would come to the studio and was like, oh, this is. This is legit. Oh, you really, you really doing? You really mm. fuck up with this, right? And then we we just started doing what we do. And I was all, so as I as there was a lot of what Patrice and I was talking about, but I realized that there was so much. Like Patrice was angry, like he was mad, which is 
which is really what I think is going on now with the whole red pill and the MGTOW and the manosphere. So all these dudes are so angry because, but they're angry because they don't know how to manage these situations. They don't, they're in a, in a situation where they're getting half-ass information and they're, they're losing. They're, they're constantly losing. And because they're losing, they're mad at, they're mad at the women who, who, who are getting the best of them when it's really just, you know, you, you first thing you got to do is remove the, uh, you got to remove the anger. And so a lot, yeah. we get, I still get guys who to this day will do consultations with me. You know, I, I listen to every one of the, uh, the black Phillip shows and I, I listen to each one of them five times and da, 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 da. And I, and the first thing I tell dudes is if you can't watch black Phillip or listen to black Phillip with the, with it in mind that this is entertainment stop watching it because it just makes angry and it makes people angry. And it's what's weird is we've had, I've heard Kevin Samuels refer to uh, Patrice in the black Phillips show. I've heard fresh and fit. I've heard, you know, endless dudes um, that got into this whole manosphere thing. And they, they, you know, and, and it, it is the problem with it is it's, it's angry. Everybody's angry. They're angry. They want to get. They want women to get get their comeuppance. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I mean, we just we just trashed the shit out of the Cheesecake Factory chick, but we trashed her because not because we want to get back at women. It's because her as her as an individual, she's a horrible human being. We would also, tra- but we've also said that the whole thing with Jada Pinkett and and Will Smith is it's his fault. Will Smith's fault. Yeah, yeah. But also and, the other thing is the, those guys have a lot of anger. Yeah, they don't have any practical solutions most right. of the time. Even even what you call it, even even Kevin Samuels didn't yeah. have any practical. Our Lord and Savior Kevin Samuels, no no name no above name, that name. No name above that name. <laughs> he shall remain nameless. <laughs> um, you know, no answers, just trashing people. And and what you find is more over than not is that people will people will lean into the, and this is a, this is a new phenomenon too. It's it's like. You lean into the toxicity of whatever's going on. And then people, you, you, you build a fan base. Like people love the drama. They love the, you know, they love the world star. I mean, I, that's I'm why you have on 10, 10, uh, club whores. Yeah. Night club, 10 of the, the bottle service only fans of the, of the least sensible demographic, which is like, you know, Miami uh, club chicks. And then you get angry mm-hmm. at them for being Miami, dumb Miami club chicks. Or, <laughs> like, or, or a lot of Instagram models who go, who uh, you've heard of the foodie call. What about the duty call? <laughs> oh no. Uh, what is the duty call per se here? What is this now? <laughs> the duty call is a lot. The majority of those Instagram chicks who, who was, who got millions of followers, are getting paid. They're doing strange for some change. A lot of those women are going out to Dubai to these princes and these dudes with money, and they're literally getting shitted on and pissed on and just they're willing to do whatever they need to do for money. So mm. it's all these Instagram. That doesn't make the do. reels for some reason. Yeah, I don't, it it, it, I don't yeah. know why. It's weird. But the, getting uh, but shit on a, on a yacht in the middle of the Mediterranean. This Somehow is you think that rampant, rampant that the that the the Islamic dudes who are supposed to be so righteous and paying chicks to come out and, 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 and sh- paying beautiful women to come out and shit and piss on them for the money, you know, and they're doing it. And so this chick that you're looking at in awe of, and you're going oh, the the chick who's always walking, you know, you know, you always get that shot where she's walking towards you and it just happens to be a camera there with the perfect lighting and, and everything else where on the beach or on the, on a, on a bridge or whatever. Like these, a lot of these women are prostituting themselves and they're going for the duty call. They get going for the duty call. And you got princes in Dubai that's shitting on them and pissing on them. And, and what, look, whatever, whatever you do, whatever, whatever floats your boat. And how do we get, get on this? What was this? We're talking about fresh and fit. Why? Oh, because people so are giving out frivolous information. They're giving out this frivolous information. And you're looking at these women as you're idolizing them because they're beautiful and they're attractive and, they're, and all these things in there. And there's anger about that. Yeah. And the there's angry, anger yeah. because if you have the money. Yeah, I mean, if you have one, people will do things for money. People, I mean, that that's what you know. That was what Harvey Weinstein was. It's like that dude was was like he was hideous, but he was like, I will make enough money and I will become powerful enough that I will bend people's will. What people don't look at is though, 
what kind of boss you think he was to the guys that he didn't want to fuck, fuck that had nothing for him. <laughs> they, they had he was no horrendous. interest. He oh, was yeah, horrendous. Yeah. Like, it's just horrible. a terrible, terrible dude. Yeah, his reputation, he wasn't just, and that's the other thing. It's not, he wasn't just bad to women. He was bad to everybody. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just that that his sexual interest was with women. Um, and and that was the, the thing is that um, all of these guys that leaned into, including Kevin Samuels, our Lord and Savior, had no name above him. Um, <laughs> these guys leaned into the toxicity and what happens, the phenomenon of internet content creators is once you lean into the content, right? You will, that's the fastest way to the top. But what happens is those people always want something more. So if it's, if it's a video of someone fla- falling down the stairs, right? Uh, and let, let's, let's be honest. When's the last time you heard somebody scream world star? You remember when there was a, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, World Star was big. It's been anytime a while. Anytime there was a fight or some people would scream World Star. But it's there's so many people that have leaned into the toxicity of of violence and 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 Just shock chaos yeah. content. But what happens is people the, the problem with that is when you set the precedent for that, when you start to set the precedent for that, what ultimately happens is the audience just wants it bigger. If it's a firecracker today, it's an M80 tomorrow. If it's an M80 tomorrow, it's a dy- stick of dynamite. This is that di- it's 10 stickers of dynamite. It just has to keep getting bigger. And then eventually all these guys end up in a situation where um, you know, somebody falls down the stairs, then you want to see somebody kicked down the stairs, you know, then you want to see somebody picked up and thrown down the stairs. It just it progressively gets worse. And so you don't really, you're not trying to help people, you're just you're 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 using people to to grow and that is what we never leaned into we always there always was a level of sincerity um we want men to be able to have relationships happy positive relationships so that they can raise positive and productive children and they can respect their woman and their woman respect them and 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 even to give the guidance i mean even sometimes when it's a, it's a little bit harsh um in terms of the biological clock of women and what they have to put up with I and mean, you know what i'm gonna we're gonna talk about that a little bit more on the patreon there's some some things that i, I want to explain to the people who have supported us um also patreon.com uh you really want to get into the nitty gritty uh go to patreon.com slash manschool 202 um that's how you support what we do if you like what we're doing but we never we we always leaned into helping people and i think my self-esteem is high because of the fact that no matter what the numbers are no matter what what the what my bank account looks like on a base level i've done nothing but help people or at least my intention was to help people um i'm not perfect and I, I will trash a awful, a funky asshole or or simp ass dude in a minute because I think I think we need to get back to that too. I mean, as a country, you mean? As, as a, a country, country, we need we to need get to, back to trashing. We need to simps trash and hoes. simps and hoes and punks and bitches and and liars. And I mean, the fact that everybody can, you know, the the fact that we we can't even talk about behavior, unethical behavior, in a way that it's unethical is just absurd to me. I'm not an alpha male. I'm not a beta male either. I'm just a better man. Better man. Put your happiness first, because if you don't, they won't.